an unparalleled career in public service. The Vietnam veteran turned anti-war activist who has dedicated his life to serving his country. Now John Kerry has a new mission, building a consensus to tackle the defining issue of our time, climate. What I love about it is it's an issue that everybody in the world is now seized by. People realize this is existential, has the potential to be in the future for a lot of people, but it is already for a lot of people. John Kerry is a former Democratic nominee for president, a secretary of state under President Obama, and served alongside Joe Biden in the Senate for over 20 years. He took up the role as U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate at a time he sees as pivotal. I think that the COP26 will achieve a significant increase of ambition at the beginning of the decade, which is the critical decade. In this episode of Leaders with LACWA, we talk about John Kerry's climate diplomacy, the changes he's made in his own life, and what's needed for a global agreement on tackling climate issues. We're going to break through on something. I can't tell you exactly what it's going to be, but you know, we have the challenge of going to the moon. We invented the internet. We have a rover on Mars. We can direct it from here on planet Earth. We can get this done. Secretary Kerry, thank you so much for joining us on Leaders with LACWA. Now, you say that every country has to be faster in cutting emissions. Why are we not keeping up with our Paris promises? Well, there are a lot of reasons uh, that people aren't keeping up with them. I think business as usual has been fairly compelling. COVID obviously interrupted with a certain amount of effort. But I think uh, not enough people are yet committed to be as serious about this moment as we need to be. Uh, Mother Nature has sent us some powerful messages over the course of the last year or two. Uh, we see all of the predictions of scientists coming true bigger and faster in many cases. Uh, and so uh, I think the business world is at large, for the most part, beginning to really mm -hmm. sit down and grapple with the things that we have to do. So my hope is that um, uh, some of the countries, there are 20 countries, Francine, that are the equivalent that equal 80% of all the emissions. Those 20 countries above all have to step up. So Secretary, do you see a high risk of failure at COP26? No, I don't, because I believe that at COP26, most countries in the world are gonna step up with major raising of ambition. Um, and, and I think that the COP26 will achieve a significant increase of ambition at the beginning of the decade, which is the critical decade. We have to do more, but I, I, I think that's going to be a, a marked jump up from where we were in the last few years post Paris. The president has promised to double U.S. climate finance, but it still needs congressional approval. How do you plan to achieve that? Well, I believe that uh, we will get that, that uh, funding. I can't tell you exactly which legislative piece it'll be in or whether it'll be in the budget per se. But the answer is, I think it's a strong commitment. It's an imperative. Whether you're a Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, it doesn't matter. There are no labels on what's happening with climate crisis. And so we have to step up. A hundred billion dollars has been promised over five years now to less developed countries. I think it is absolutely essential that the developed world, which is, as I said, producing 80% of all the emissions, must step up mm. in order to help less developed countries be able to respond to the crisis that the developed world has actually led the charge in creating. But how do, does, do you and how does the U.S. actually build trust with developing nations when you're trying to persuade them to cut their emissions when they don't have a guarantee that the U.S. can do it? Well, we can do it. We are doing it. We actually are now on a track to be able to do it. And we have a climate coordinator in the United States, Gina McCarthy, who together with her team has done a terrific job of coordinating efforts around our nation. Uh, governors, Republican, Democrat alike, mayors uh, are all committed to be moving in that direction. Many of them did incredible work in the last four years when President Trump you know, pulled out of the agreement they continued for United States efforts. So as an example, about 75% of the new electricity that has come online in the United States is from renewables. So there is an effort going now to deploy more renewable, to shift, uh, particularly to shift away from fossil fuel. 
and to begin to look at the alternatives. There's also an enormous amount of research being done. And people like Bill Gates and others are, are doing what's called the Breakthrough Initiative. They're looking at possibilities of new generation of smaller modular nuclear and other kinds of possibilities here. So I'm confident that when we push the curve on the technology, when we do the work of the innovation and the effort to deploy that we are capable of doing, we can get there. The next 10 years are the critical years, this decade. From 2020 to 2030, we must reduce by 50% in order to keep the 1.5 degrees alive. We are on track. We currently have a plan because yeah. President Biden created that plan. And he has put it in place for the best. But you heard him announce with Ford Motor Company and General Motors and others that by 2030, 50 percent of the automobiles sold in the United States will be electric. The president has set a goal that by 2035, our power sector will be carbon free, no oil, gas or, or coal. So those are strong goals, and they are achievable. And I believe uh, President Biden is putting the country on a course to able to, to achieve them. Secretary, to the cynics that say that actually COP26 is just another high-level meeting where there's a lot of talk but no substance or no action, or to the climate activists that also question what our leaders are really doing, what do you tell them? Well, it's uh, the Glasgow meeting is not just talk. Uh, we have been engaged at President Biden's direction in major international diplomacy over the course of the last nine months. We are working with basically uh, all countries, but principally with those 20 countries that I talked about that are responsible for 80 percent of all the emissions. And the fact is that most of those countries are announcing new reduction levels and they are announcing them because of the meeting in Glasgow. They are submitting those new plans to the United Nations. In many cases, those new plans are significant reductions, uh, particularly with the 55% of global GDP that I mentioned to you is committed to the 1.5 degree limit track. So the fact is that Europe has committed to a reduction of 55% over the course of the next 10 years. The UK, 78 percent. The United States, 50 to 52 percent. Canada, 46 percent to 50 percent. Japan, uh, 45 percent to 50 percent. Mm. So the scientists tell us we have to cut by 45 percent over the course of the next uh, 10 years. That's exactly what the 55 percent have committed to do. Now we have to get other nations to step up. We're working with Russia, we're working with South Africa, with Mexico, with Brazil, with uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, with, I mean, a whole group, India, a whole group of countries, and, and they are right now uh, sharpening their pencils and working uh, to uh, shape the announcements that they're prepared to make in Glasgow. So Glasgow will be a raising of global ambition. It will not guarantee that we are absolutely, as a planet, all on track, but you will have many, many countries raising their effort uh, to very significant levels, and I think there will be much more that comes in the months and in the year or so after that. Up next, diplomatic tensions collide with the race to net zero. John Kerry's views on the challenges and opportunities of U.S.-China cooperation on climate. We're not trading off anything in other issues. What we're doing is trying to make, I'm certainly focused exclusively on the climate track and trying to see how much progress we can make there. John Kerry is a veteran diplomat, a former U.S. Senator and Secretary of State. And his diplomatic skills are getting put to use in his new role as U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, particularly when it comes to relations between the United States and China. Secretary, what about China? So the country said it will stop financing coal plants abroad, but not at home. Should the U.S. and actually, you know, China not make a pledge to phase out these coal-fired plants at home? 
Well, we've, we've expressed concern, obviously, to China about the level of coal. That's not a secret. Um, we've been working with the Chinese. President Xi is very focused on this issue. He's personally involved in decision making. Uh, and, and I'm confident in the next weeks we're going to be getting together with China. We hope we can find uh, more common ground for uh, moving the process forward. And we're looking at a number of different ways in which we might be able to do that. So I remain uh, hopeful that we can still get something done before we go to Glasgow. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm hopeful that China will on its own, that President Xi will make the decision that they could move further with respect to uh, the reduction of emissions during the course mm -hmm. of the next 10 years. Is climate cooperation with China actually tied to you know, U.S. diplomatic relations with China? Well, I mean, everything we're doing with China is a consequence of diplomacy, and, and obviously those conversations are taking place. President Biden and President Xi both agreed in their first conversation that they wanted to try to make progress on climate and that it shouldn't be held hostage to other issues. Uh, we're not trading off anything in other issues. What we're doing is trying to make pro I'm certainly focused exclusively on the climate track and trying to see how much progress we can make there. Needless to say, in the last months, few months, uh, those efforts have been somewhat entangled by some of the other things. My hope is in the next four weeks we can make some more progress. Uh, why is it so difficult to have a clear definition of net zero? And how much would that actually help businesses to track and to do better and governments to do the same? I think there will be a clear definition of net zero by the end of the COP, the end of the meeting in Glasgow. Uh, I'm confident that uh, people are working on that. They're also working on something called the rule book. It's pretty archaic. It's, it's technical language for how one measures what people are doing and what the transparency rules will be and so forth. That, we hope, will be one of the outcomes of the meeting in Glasgow. So I think we're on a constructive track to make progress there. We talk a lot about greenwashing, especially amongst businesses or certainly in the financial community, uh, Secretary. Are carbon credits and offsets a meaningful way to deal with climate change? They're a necessary uh, problematic way to do it. Uh, we need offsets to be able to do some of the things we need to do quickly. But you can't have them going on and on forever or you, you simply don't wind up with the reductions that you need. So that is one of the issues that will be the subject of discussion and is already the subject of discussion in the working on that instrument I just mentioned called the rule book. And hopefully out of Glasgow there will, become, there will come uh, unanimity with respect to how people are approaching that. Uh, but what we need are real reductions more than we need. I mean, offsets are necessary to get some companies over the hump and get them started, uh, but we can't rely on them in the long run because otherwise you don't get the reductions that you need. What are some of the conversations you're, you're having with financial companies? So th there seems to be a, a time problem, or at least a timeline problem, because the finance industry may not be able to actually reallocate capital in time to avoid some of those you know, dangerous temperature gains. So what do you do? Actually, the world of finance has been uh, stepping up in these last months. Uh, the six largest banks in America have announced how much they will invest over the next 10 years in climate activity, climate-related initiatives. And the amount of money they have laid out, the six of them, is $4.16 trillion over 10 years. That is money for commercial ventures and operations, but energy is a, is a sector that should lend itself to commercial uh, solution. I mean, if you have the ability to deploy renewable energy, for instance, solar or, let's say, wind, and those uh, projects are put out, let, at a level where there is a sufficient revenue stream, there's no reason why that isn't a long-term investment in commercial sector. It's a, it's a straightforward deal. And you can get a power purchase power agreement that lasts for 20, 25, 30 years, which gives you a return on that revenue. And that's how you can wind up deploying very, very rapidly. We're working with India right now. India has made a commitment 
to deploy 450 gigawatts of renewable energy. But India will need finance and technology to help move that as fast as it needs to go. We've created a partnership with India. We're going to work with India closely and, and hopefully uh, those, uh, those uh, purchase power, the power purchase agreements can be put together in a way that allows those projects to go forward. And we're doing that on a global basis. We're working with Indonesia. We're working with South Africa. We're going to work with other countries in order to try to help bring the finance to technology to the table so they can make the transition. And that's one of the reasons why the $100 billion is so critical, because that was promised to developing countries in order to help them be able to get over the hurdle of the transition, which they cannot afford to do on their own. Up next, John Kerry is at the center of global climate diplomacy, and it's had an effect on his habits and his lifestyle. We'll discuss who Secretary Kerry admires and what the job means to him. What I love about it is uh, it's, it's an issue that everybody in the world is now seized by. People realize this is existential, has the potential to be in the future for a lot of people, but it is already for a lot of people. John Kerry has one of the most high-profile jobs on the world stage as U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, meeting with world leaders to try to secure commitments to decarbonize. I asked who Secretary Kerry admires and what this pivotal new role means to him on a personal level. Secretary, what do you like most about your job and what do you find most frustrating? <laughs> I find uh, frustrating that we don't have the money in the budget at this point in time, and we're not uh, just putting it out there on a rapid basis to get the speed that we need for this transition. Um, and uh, we've got to work around the edges to make that happen. Uh, what I love about it is uh, it's, it's an issue that everybody in the world is now seized by. People realize this is existential, has the potential to be in the future for a lot of people, but it is already for a lot of people. And so you have people all around the world, some of whom have to move because they can't live where they're living anymore. The heat is getting intolerable. The drought is too long. The production of food is interrupted. Their water supplies are diminished. And we in the United States uh, have the ability to be able to do something about it and make a difference in their lives and indeed uh, in the future for all of us. That's a pretty big privilege to be able to help uh, work on. And I have a superb team, all of whom are focused on Glasgow uh, as the jumping off spot to really try to create a framework through which we can uh, make good things happen. And that's what we're trying to do. How confident are you that it's the new technologies and actually technologies that also get cheaper that will really lead to a radical transformation? I'm confident about it because that's something that we in the United States and some other countries do extremely well. We had to do vaccines, we did vaccines. We had to deal with AIDS, we dealt with AIDS and came up with a you know program for various parts of the world and made a difference. Uh, we needed to stop Ebola under President Obama. We stopped Ebola in West Africa. Millions of people were predicted they were going to die. 11,000. It's too many, but we lost only 11,000 compared to the millions. We can do these things. We've cured uh, diseases. I mean, we deal with smallpox. We deal with polio. We are making progress in so many different ways that never gets reported on adequately because mm -hmm. It's the crisis that obviously commands attention. But the fact is that when I was in college, the severe poverty rate was over 50%. Today, for the first time ever in history, it's below 10% in the world. If you're a woman in the world today and you're pregnant, you're 50% more likely to give birth to your child and that your child will be fed. Uh, I mean, there are, there's just an enormous amount that we are capable of doing if we put our minds to it. We are now researching and developing in, in carbon capture and storage, in battery storage, in green hydrogen, in direct air carbon capture. Uh, we're going to break through on something. I can't tell you exactly what it's going to be, 
But, you know, we had the challenge of going to the moon. We invented the Internet. We have a rover on Mars. We can direct it from here on planet Earth. We can get this done. Is there someone you admire in the space for clarity of mind or, you know, drive a fire in the belly to get this done in the sustainable space? Well, there are many people, and, and it begins with, you know, Jim Hansen, who testified to us when we were in the United States Senate in 1988 and told us climate crisis is here, it's happening. And then there are just so many people who've been on the front lines of, of this fight for so long, uh, including now, most importantly, young people, kids in schools who are willing to, you know, strike and willing to step out and lead the efforts of accountability. And they're asking the adults to be adults. Pretty simple request. Do the things that we know we have to do. Be responsible as leaders in public places and get the job done. Uh, it seems to me that's, that's <laughs> by far not too much to ask. Yeah. Given the fires, given the tornadoes, given the floods, given the UN reports, how many climate change deniers do you still meet? You know, I don't, I, I, I'm not counting the deniers now. We're, we're beyond that. The evidence is clear. People are uh, accepting the science in a large majority in the United States and around the world. We are the only country, by the way, where we have people called deniers in that level and who, who, who are denied for as long as they have the consequences of climate. But even now, many of them are changing because they've seen what's happening in their homes, in their states, the floods, the fires, the mudslides, the air quality. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's pretty hard to miss it now. So I don't think the challenge now is deniers. I think the challenge is getting both parties because climate has no affiliation with any party or ideology. Get everybody together Listen to the scientists. This is not a matter of ideology. It's not a matter of politics. It's about arithmetic and physics. And the scientists are doing what they're doing based on that arithmetic and physics. And they're telling us what we need to do as public people, as, as policymakers. That's the challenge. Secretary, have you changed anything in your lifestyle to actually help the cause against climate change? Uh, in, indeed, I have. Um, uh, my, my, I have a, a solar system for, for my home. I drive an electric car now. Uh, I still have the, best, the, the <laughs> one uh, internal combustion engine vehicle, which is being traded for another electric car. And, and we're making more conscious decisions about our use of energy uh, within a house. I mean, I've become a flagrant light switch, you know, a chaser <laughs> whenever I walk through a room or a building. I mean, yes, I think there's a new consciousness. Am I doing everything that I should be or could be? Probably not. Uh, but I'm super conscious of the need to try to all of us do what we can to make a contribution here. The biggest thing I'm doing in my lifestyle is traveling around the world trying to do diplomacy and uh, help make a larger decision in the context of Glasgow uh, that could reduce uh, a lot of the anxiety that we're all living with today about where we're headed. Secretary Kerry, thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure, thanks for having me.